Hi everyone, my name is Marissa Evangelista. I'm an MFA intern and I will be your moderator for tonight's We'll Talk with Artists. Our digital discussion tonight is with Paint Annapolis juried artist Amanda Milliner. Amanda is a representational artist who paints Ala Prima from life in both plein air and in her studio. She uses her impressions of color and light to describe everyday scenes. Since showing her work for over 20 years, Amanda has become known for her use of vibrant colors. Currently, she is investigating the balance of light and dark with compositions rooted in no tan design. Additionally, I would like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs in the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to bridge the gap between artists and the public. All right. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, and thank you, Amanda, for um, agreeing to do this. And congratulations on being juried in. Uh, to paint Annapolis. I think uh, those who have been watching us, uh, the Will Talks, for a while know that around this time of year, we try to uh, help promote the Paint Annapolis uh, plein air competition by interviewing some of the artists that have been juried in. Uh, so this week and the next few weeks, it's not necessarily going to be an MFA uh, member artists that we're interviewing, but uh, sort of an adopted, if you way, uh, if you uh, might say, uh, member artist. And with Amanda, the connection goes a lot deeper than with most of our Paint Annapolis artists. In fact, Amanda is a native of Anne Arundel County. Woohoo! Yes, I am. <laughs> uh, how did you decide to become an artist? Was it the beautiful countryside of Anne Arundel <laughs> County or, and, and where did you study? I've just always been interested in art from, uh, from day one. Um, as a kid, that was my favorite toy to play with. I was interested in all of the colors in the crayon box mm -hmm. and <laughs> using them all at once. Um, <laughs> I've, you know, taken art classes since a young age. I think, um, speaking of locally in Anne Arundel County, I took a, one of my first art classes outside of school, maybe in like second grade at Maryland Hall in Annapolis. Oh, wow. Um, so I, I just had a lot of, you know, really good teachers and encouragement to pursue that. My parents were always very supportive as well, you know, living in Maryland so close to Washington, D.C., oftentimes like either during winter break or summer break, my mom would bring us to the National Gallery. So I don't know, I've just always had a fascination with art. Um, I think specifically when I was younger, maybe even Impressionism. I mean, from a very young age, I just remember gravitating towards those colors. And my mom had prints in the house, so of Monet and um, Renoir and Mary Cassatt. So just always kind of loved that work. Did you have um, in your high school, was there an art class? Did that... Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, I was really active in art in high school. I had an amazing high school art teacher. I actually think she's known pretty well around the Annapolis area. Her name's Sharon Liddick. Um, she's now married to John Egersberger, who's also oh, yeah. a pretty well-known Annapolis artist. And to my understanding, Sharon actually taught other artists in the area through public school, like Abigail McBride and uh, Rick Casali, yeah. who's a, a sculptor. Yeah. Um, so I had a, an amazing foundation with her. I mean, she taught me how to draw. Um, I did my first plenary paintings with her. She got me out there wow. with a French easel at like, I'm thinking like 17, 18, um, taught me how to mix oil paint, make colors. Um, so I think that was a really good foundation. I was, I just got really lucky with that. And, um, she went to, Micah, the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And so she um, encouraged me to do that as well. So she kind of got me on that art track. <laughs> that was, that was going to be my next question because I knew you had uh, received your diploma there. Um, and at uh, the Maryland Institute, when you get a, a diploma from them, you're introduced to the history of art, aren't you? In some of the, um, you have some classes that emphasize that a little? Oh, definitely. Um, I was very interested in art history. Um, even though I was a studio arts major, I majored in painting. Um, I still was an art history minor. So that was really important to me. 
Um, uh, you know, there was a lot of really good classes there, but I also took some during the summers at uh, University of Maryland. And ultimately I studied abroad in Florence, Italy at Studio Art Centers International and actually got to do some on-site art history classes there, which I've always been very interested in Renaissance art as well. I know I'm bouncing all over the place, like Impressionism, Renaissance, but um, very interested in that as well. So I was uh, very fortunate to have that experience and see a lot of that artwork in person, artwork that I have been looking at in books my whole life. <laughs> so with that kind of background, uh, the last thing that I want to touch on about your background is you're more familiar than many people, uh, including people in the audience, I think, with the history of Western landscape art. Uh, and so my question is, uh, are there any um, of the old masters, if you will, uh, you know, the canonical artists of uh, landscape painting that particularly affect the way that you paint or the way that you think about your uh, painting? Um, as far as you mean, like old masters, Renaissance artists. No, I mean, I mean, in... old master with a with small letters. You know, and anybody who is in the museums and celebrated for painting landscapes. Oh gosh, I mean, I guess the easiest <laughs> answer would be John Singer Sargent. I think every plein air painter just worships him. I mean. Uh... I got to see one of his shows a few years ago at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It was mostly watercolors and some yeah. of his mm -hmm. um, oil paintings, but it was like a group show. And I can just remember going to see that show and and crying like in person. Um, and I'm not really one to do that <laughs> on the spot, but um, just the, the brushwork and simplicity. I mean, the economy of stroke, every... Yes. It's like everything is done with so much intention. And I mean, I struggle with something like watercolor. I mean, that's why I'm an oil painter, because if I mess something up, I just like to be able to cover it up. But okay. Okay. he was just so good um, with that. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that's the well, first person who comes to mind. You did that did more than answer my question, because I think the way that you responded uh, is as a painter I uh, would, I think, to his watercolors. To his great facility and his technical genius. I mean, that's to me as an art historian and a student of American art, that's what I think is most impressive about him, not his famous portraits for all kinds of, you know, aristocrats and wealthy individuals, but rather he was a genius. Uh, I think the only American watercolorist that I would put above him is Winslow Homer. Uh, uh, so anyway, enough about that and enough about <laughs> background. Let's start to look at your work because I think your work is really intensely uh, colorful in, in the best sense of the word. I mean, it just grabs you when you see uh, the vibrant colors, so. All right. So, I, you mentioned before we went live that you have a garden. Was this literally painted in your garden? Yes, a lot of times um, I actually just paint outside in my backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's kind of just I'll just transport my uh, studio out there. Um, it's just easier than packing everything up in the car and going off to some far off yeah. place. Yeah. So sometimes um, even when I'm I am just out there gardening, you know, like this, I kind of remember uh, I painted this last spring and I just saw it um, sitting on a table outside and it was in the afternoon and I thought, huh, that would be an interesting painting. And it kind of came back to it, reset it up. But yeah, I, I did this in plein air. This is like a 16 by 20 that I did in maybe about two and a half hours, one sitting, mm -hmm. pretty loose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it, I, a lot of times I make no tan drawings, which is just a kind of like a thumbnail sketch of light and dark to start out with. And I remember this having a very distinct light and dark pattern that really interest, interested me, as well as kind of like the warm and the cool, like the 
almost like yellow and purple um, were kind of the dominant colors of this. And um, yeah, uh, I just actually got back from Charleston, South Carolina. This particular painting, I'm very excited, was um, juried into the Oil Painters of America National Juried Exhibition. Congratulations. There at Thank you at Reinhardt Fine Art Gallery. And um, yeah, that was my first um, big national OPA event. And I went and got to meet a lot of amazing painters and obviously all the work in the show just to see contemporary oil painters, you know, yeah. how they're using the medium, you know, what they see, how they're translating it was just really revolutionary for me. It was, it sure. was amazing to kind of see it all in person. So. Well, it's interesting um, uh, when I looked at your work and when I saw that you had uh, chosen this as the work that you wanted us to look at uh, first, what struck me was in this instance, not the color, but the light and dark. And you, when you talked about the painting, you talked about that a great deal. What is most fundamental to your conception of uh, painting? Is it the light? or the uh, color? Well, I've always been drawn to color. Obviously my paintings are very, very colorful. Mm -hmm. um, I love all the color interactions, but I'm starting to learn, you know, I think a few years ago, I was really struggling with value. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I would see color kind of first. And I think that is something that a lot of beginning painters struggle with. You know, I teach painting as well. And I had to develop a way to kind of pull what was the most important out. You know, if when um, we think about our vision, our vision actually sees contrast first. Yes. And once I um, realized that, and you know, I, I realized a lot of other plein air painters use no tan to kind of pull out those lights and darks to really find the balance. You know, a lot of composition is the balance of light and dark. There can be all these fun colors and everything else going on that interests me immensely, but I think there has to be kind of the the bones, the the underlying structure of light and dark, um, for for people to to see it and connect with it. I, I don't know. Maybe uh, that's no. That, that was beautifully said. I think because what I was the reason I asked you the question is because here. It's a dark color, but it's really the darkness, the contrast that you mentioned, the, the dark purples that are a, a literal foundation to this whole composition. And those beautiful colors, those brighter colors rest on, securely on that foundation. So, um, you know, all of my training as an art historian and my years as a public speaker, uh, I'm glad to have you explain this painting to our listeners because I there's no way I could have done that better. I mean, that's the way. <laughs> now I understand how you build a painting and how your how your paintings have become so uh, strikingly strong. It's not the color; it's that's that realization of the contrast between light and dark and how you build the painting. So let's look at another one. Sure. Well, this looks familiar. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, last year I was a public painter at Paint Annapolis, and I really appreciate that the last few years the MFA has allowed the public painters to show several paintings. And, um, you know, especially with my schedule, you know, I had to do a few things during the week. And <laughs> I actually ended up painting this painting right before I had to turn it in. I think the paintings were due at five o'clock and I had a window after work and I just started painting this around two o'clock on Maryland Avenue, looking yeah. towards the Capitol. And um, I had some shade, which was great. That's the number one thing, everybody, that I always look for is shade. Um, and yeah, I don't typically work well under pressure, but this was a painting that kind of just came together quickly for me. <laughs> so I was very grateful for that. You know, sometimes in plein air, it's like struggle, struggle, struggle. But yeah. this was a nice, um, yeah, I just had a lot of fun painting it. 
um, okay. exploring the the worms and the cools. It, it's a it's a lovely painting, but here's my question. Uh, I, knowing Annapolis so well, having lived here for a long time and given walking tours of the historic district uh, many, many times, these aren't the real colors of those brick buildings. <laughs> they, these are not true to nature. This isn't an impressionist uh, eye. So why is that? I mean, I'm, I love impressionism, but I guess at the root of things, I'm really a colorist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is I'm, I'm somewhat inventive with my color and mm -hmm. I, I stress or exaggerate color. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually something in my paintings <laughs> that I'm kind of endeavoring to control a little bit more with the balance of grays. But in this particular painting, as far as how I painted last year, um, I don't know. Um, I think the use of the no tan and looking at lights and darks has helped me to kind of at least organize my colors into light and shade. Mm -hmm. But it is very, yes, just very colorful. <laughs> well, um, I don't I don't mean that question to be in any way critical. In fact, I think again, you clearly are working deliberately and you're self-aware of what it is you're doing because there is a structure, there's balance, there are all of those things. But this, if I were wearing my art historian's hat, and uh, you know, was, this was flashed up to me in some uh, graduate school examination. I would. This looks more like German impressionism. I mean, German expressionism than French impressionism. Oh. It even looks oh, a little like early Kandinsky, who was influenced by the German expressionists. So, whether you whether you're doing it with a historical awareness of these other artists or not, to my eye, to my mind, to my critical judgment, uh, you know, this is a, a very strong uh, expressionist painting. And so I don't know if you're veering away from it or towards it or whether we'll see uh, that. And when we look at the other um, sl uh, slides, but don't abandon this because <laughs> you've, got you've got something going here, at least I think. Uh, oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought that, but I think I do try to also be expressive when I paint. Yeah. Um, so I guess that does kind of make sense to me. Well, yeah. to me, I think it might have struck me, especially um, with a special force, because I'm so accustomed to seeing more conventional, impressionistic uh, or plein air paintings of this same view. I mean, yeah, this is a view that every year gets painted uh, in Paint Annapolis. Uh, so you've done it with this expressive intensity, but it all holds together. Uh, you know, and that's not something that you did something more original, in my opinion, than what one typically sees when painters take this view. Oh, well, interesting. Thank you. <laughs> or whatever it's worth. That's my two cents. <laughs> I'll take uh, it. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Let's 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 look at the next uh, example of your work. Well, this is, okay. you know, but let me just repeat what I said a moment ago. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, I don't think the colors are going to tone down anytime soon. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, then let me let me approach it this way. Let me ask you a question because of what you just said. How do you select those colors? They're not the colors that you're seeing with your eye. For Ellicott City, I know this view very well too, as I think many of our listeners uh, do. Um, why that palette? So interestingly enough, I've in the past few years been using a limited palette to try to limit my colors because I found um, that my colors were not very harmonious. So I've taken tips from other plein air painters. I only use six pigments on my palette, typically when I paint outside. Mm -hmm. That's a warm and cool of each primary. And, but as far as what, why I chose these colors, um, you know, 
I don't know. I think I approach this very similarly to the first painting or even the second painting in that I did have a strong light and dark balance that I was looking at. Um, like I knew where the shadows were. I knew where the lights were. And I had a an idea for the composition. I thought, you know, I kind of like this S-shaped composition. Mm -hmm. If anyone's been to Ellicott City, yeah. it obviously goes uphill and I had to create depth. Um, so I don't know, a lot of times I do, I'm finding a little bit of my crutches that I tend to use violet as my dark. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm <laughs> moving towards, um, you know, working on, but I mean, there's pinks and blues and other colors in there. Um, and even reds, I don't know. I just, to a certain degree, I do try to paint what I see. Um, okay, you know, me, there are some brick you. buildings. Let, let me interrupt <laughs> you right there. Sure. Are you, when you say you paint what you see, I would say you're painting from the gut. I, I think I am. I Like I said, I mean, I do... <laughs> My color is inventive. I do over exaggerate it. Yeah. Um, uh, and with this, I mean, this just looks particularly expressive to me because it just has a lot of mark making and brushwork. Yes. That kind of aids in that. And my intent with this, this is actually one of the biggest plein air paintings I've done to um, to date. Last year, I bought a large format easel, and my one of my big goals every year, I try to set art goals. Last year, my art goal was I want to paint big in plein air. Mm -hmm. And so I got a large um, format easel, a Gloucester style easel. And um, this is a 24 by 36. And I just had to cover the canvas. I mean, I painted this in two sessions. I went back the next day, same two hour time frame. So I would say this painting was painted in four hours, like two and two. Mm -hmm. And I just had to lay in the color i mean some of it is just an average of a value or a color but i just had to get it on there and i i make these quick drawings and sometimes i love the marks in my drawings and i thought oh wouldn't it be great if my painting had some of that same um uh, just movement and uh mark making so i i think that's where i was going with this <laughs> Um, well, here's here's one of the reasons that I, I sort of reacted the way I did. When you first look at this painting, uh, well, at least for me, when I first looked at it, of course, the part, the automobile, the purples, you know, uh, all of those things are in the foreground and they catch your eye. But the next thing I noticed was the uh, clouds in the sky, which are coloristically quite uh, naturalistic. <laughs> and then I noticed that the, the buildings in the upper right are more naturalistic in their color and very brightly lit. And then when you get down to the street level, that's when you're really letting <laughs> letting go, uh, sort of. You know, it's much more uh, subjective. It's much more expressive. Um, that's a it, it's a really interesting painting. Uh, it's more than just the sum of its colors and brush strokes. You're a plein air painter. I love plein air painting, but plein air painting sometimes seems to be just, oh, you found a, a, a nice, pleasant subject and you have the facility with your brushes to record it. But this is more than that. This is sort of, to me, the next level where there's an awful lot of Amanda. I, uh, <laughs> and, and, a, and a lot more emotion in this uh, painting of what to me is a very familiar scene. I feel pretty connected to old Ellicott City. Um, <laughs> it's not my hometown or anything, but I am a part of an artist collective there on Main Street. Oh. So I'm there pretty frequently working at the gallery and I always do the Ellicott City plein air event. You know, if people are looking for other Maryland plein air mm -hmm. events. and um, so I think I do have like a little connection to that city. I love the wonky buildings yeah. and the <laughs> telephone poles that look like they're going to fall over. <laughs> so, you know, it just, there's something about it that's expressive just in the, the gestures of the buildings themselves in a way, or um, the way the street goes up. So maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful painting. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So let's look at the um, now, you know, now the art historian in me, I have to bite my lip and just let <laughs> you tell us all <laughs> about this painting. <laughs> um, so the first three were examples of my plein air work. And these next three are essentially studio paintings. Um, I do a lot of still life. I do outdoor still life and plein air, but I also do it in my studio at home. And um, I did this painting this winter. Um, I really like fabric and just the patterns and the flow of fabric. Again, I mean, this has composition in the sense of the, you know, the light and the dark and the movement mm -hmm. of the colors going around. Um, I'm sure with art history, I mean, there's tons of still lifes to reference. Um, maybe something that comes to mind even for me is something like Cezanne. I used a flat brush to do this painting. Um, so there's kind of just like chunks of color and that just really appeals to me, even though it's just a lemon and an apple and a pomegranate, you know, it's just, I like to see, um, I don't know, just the facets in the color, the, the way it goes around the form really interests me. There are a lot of passages in this that uh, do remind me of um, Cezanne's way of putting the colors on the surface to emphasize the, the form, the volumetric quality. But you're, uh, this isn't to my eye anyway imitative. And I like the way that you've explored the sliced lemons and the sliced um, pomegranate. Um, and then you have two ceramic vessels. So you have textures and, and materials uh, and you have all of these different things that there's a lot of pieces to this, but you've held mm -hmm. them all together. And, and I think that there are so many parts to this that um, not everybody would hold it together uh, the way you did. So, and I was obviously fishing for Saison. Um, <laughs> I just looked at this and that's that first thing that popped into my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I look at something like this. I made this in my studio and I can't even really tell you why I painted it. You know, I mean, that. Sometimes I just compose things like on a table and yeah. I think, oh, I just like the way that looks. I'm going to paint that. Yeah. And maybe it's just stuff that I have that day. Maybe it's stuff that's lying around. And sometimes it comes out good and other times it's a mess. But I felt, you know, I felt good about this one. I felt like yeah. it kind of addressed the things that I'm interested in. The slice of lemon that is in the lower center, it almost makes a vertical line from mm -hmm. the uh, bottom edge. How deliberate were you about putting it there in that position? So I'm just curious. You know, it is a little off kilter. It's not perfectly vertical, but I, you know what I think I was thinking when I, sometimes I line things up and I thought this would make a really nice crisp edge if the yeah. light part of the top of that lemon hit into the shadow. So I might've sat there and moved it around a little bit, and then thought, oh, yeah, that that works for me. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't expect you to remember exactly. But I did think from our conversation so far that you might say something like you just said. And to me, it's the fact that you thoughtfully placed it a little off the vertical. If it were on the vertical, I think it would fail. Or at least, yeah, be, that would really bother me. <laughs> yes, yes, because it would be so noticeable that you look right at that. Right, yeah. You know, so that adjustment really helps it be an anchor, but also uh, a way into the composition, the rest of the composition. Okay, so uh, is the next image a still life also? Yeah. Yes, so this oh. is a still life. It's quite different. It is. The, the last two are actually some of my more recent paintings. They're, um, I'm going to be a featured artist in June at the Artist Gallery in Ellicott City. And Great. since I, it was a June show, I decided to make some summer paintings. Um, even though I painted this, I think, in February in my studio, um, 
I did paint this from life, like these objects, mm -hmm. my beach bag, my beach towel, the hat and the book and everything were all assembled. I composed that with some drawings, but I wanted to make it look like it was outside. Um, I don't know if I succeeded or not, but I had to take some of my plein air knowledge to do that. Like, how does the sun beat down on things? What uh, what would these objects look like in intense sun? I had to, again, um, stress that, or intensify it. So yeah, this is just a still life I did in my studio. Now, it, it's, it's uh, very interesting to me that you uh, commented emphatically on trying to make it look like it was outdoors or trying to make it look, what I, what I heard was you were trying to make it look more naturalistic and plein air. Yes. <laughs> okay. But what strikes me about it is that it is very clearly a painting in the sense that this is an, an image constructed by an artist. It doesn't matter whether you were outside or whether you were in the studio. The underlying structure here is not obvious or uh, off-putting. But it's the structure that holds, to me, so much color together. So if this is your new direction, I'm really enjoying seeing your new direction. Not that <laughs> there's not that there wasn't uh, a great, uh, for me, pleasure in looking at your earlier work. This is a, you know, I've only seen five of your paintings and a few on your website. So I don't have a lot to go on, but I really see a change in direction and you selected them and you put them in this order so i think you're very aware of it and then your comments suggest mm -hmm. it, it was very deliberate all i'm saying is i like where i see you going in your paintings and and i think we have one more to look at right yes we have one more oh great <laughs> a perfect way to <laughs> i end. had i had to put a maryland painting yeah. in there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In case you guys didn't know, <laughs> I'm yeah. from Maryland. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you actually like uh, crabs? <laughs> I love crabs. And actually, uh, my my family has them every year together. So um, I know that's really cliche, but it, no. it you no. know, people say paint what you know, paint what yeah. you love. And I really do love crabs. Yeah. Um, and just seeing them like gets me excited. I mean, the same way other people get excited about other yeah. types of food at family gatherings. So, um, you know, this painting is also a square. Like recently I've been kind of working in squares, which I think are a little harder to compose, but yes. um, uh, I did this from a photograph. I don't typically work from photographs, but again, it was, it was a photo that I took outside of the crabs and I really like that. Um, intense sunlight on them and I really like this is almost like primary colors you've got like blue mm -hmm. yellow red um, and there's just something about that and playing within those colors that I think just looks simple but interesting yeah. um, well I think that uh, of course the subject to a Marylander uh, you know not everybody loves crabs I love to eat them but I will not pick them <laughs> give me a lobster exactly. any day uh, <laughs> yes <exactly. laughs> they're a lot of work they really are but <laughs> yeah um but the way that you've painted the shadows uh i think is very uh interesting in and of itself uh so for me i again i you know i i did not prepare by looking carefully at this stuff so anything i say is off the cuff uh and completely sincere at first i i'm the kind of person that um oh, uh, more crabs well you know i don't want to look at more crabs. <laughs> <laughs> but the painterly way that you've handled it especially in the uh shadows the blue shadows is in and of itself i'd look at the painting just so i could look at that um and and for me at least that was a big lift to get me over seeing more crabs <laughs> <laughs> well good good maybe it just inches you a little bit closer to my side like yeah you please yeah. love them i love them <laughs> oh i love them i love them i just have to have somebody else do it again. That's cool. 
<laughs> well, uh, it's been, it really has been very enjoyable to talk with you and to look at your paintings and to see the direction that you're now taking more recently. Um, and I do really encourage you to at least follow, you know, wherever it takes you, because I think it's, a, it looks like a very path with a lot of potential. But we have time. Who out there in our audience has questions? I have some comments about your work too, and just how much I love it. So I'm actually currently taking a class with Abigail McBride. I'm taking portraiture with her at AACC, and she's a colorist yes. as well. And yes. well, I'm actually, um, she doesn't teach um, her interpretations of colors in that class. We always have discussions about color, and she talks about it like she's creating her color experience with the pigments and I feel like you I'm also experiencing the vibrancy of the world vicariously through your art and the beauty of it so it's really exciting oh to thank you hear you talk about color and value in that way as well and I really do get the sense of no tan in your work as well since that's something I'm just starting to learn about myself and these are like great ways for me to study to how to apply it in my own work Marissa, oh great, was... thank you. No, I mean I I do teach. I teach at the in Maryland, mostly in Howard County, at the Howard mm -hmm. County Center for the Arts and the Columbia Art Center. And I teach painting, drawing, and sometimes printmaking. And a lot of times, you know, I think color is the hardest thing to teach, but it's like the number one thing students ask about. Mm -hmm. And obviously when you see my paintings, it kind of, you know hit you over the head with color. And so they're always asking, well, how did you see that? Or how did you come up with that? And um, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> it's kind of interpretive. I just, I mean, I can remember this time when I was just getting into painting when I was maybe like 18 or 19 and she took me out to Western Maryland um, and to do a, like a paint event. Mm -hmm. And on the way we were in the car and she just was pointing at things and she said, um what colors would you mix to mix that tree line mm -hmm. or what colors would you mix to make that sky and just having those conversations and talking it out oh I would mix this with this with this I mean I just think it's just years and years of just kind of coming up with my own <laughs> combinations or recipes um that kind of get me to that place I don't I don't know but a lot of it is really intuitive I think Mm -hmm. You know, I, I look at something and I say, is it warm or is it cool? Okay, if it's cool, what kind of cool, <laughs> you know? Right, um, right. Is it leaning, is it leaning violet? Is it leaning blue? Is it leaning dark red? I mean, even a warm color can be cool. And that's what I love about painting is like, there's just a lot of ambiguity. Like, even though I'm talking about light and dark, like sometimes in the shadow, there's warm shadows mm -hmm. um, or there could be cool light. So and that's even harder too, when you're talking to students about it. You know, I think everybody kind of has to figure out their own like visual language in a way, but I try to point it out. I'm like, do you see this? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And so I just think like looking at stuff really hard and figuring out like how you would interpret it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and talking about finding a visual language, I think one thing that I've encountered is that an artist who doesn't discover their own visual language really doesn't succeed unless they have a gimmick or something, something you know, in the modern era, in the world of art, uh, and it still happens today, somebody who seems to have something that no one else has ever done gets a certain amount of attention. But the mm -hmm. artist that really has staying power has to find their own vision. It might be unique yeah. and nobody's ever seen the world that way before, but somebody like yourself, you're doing something that's very traditional uh, now for two, almost 200 years, painting out of doors, uh, being inspired by the light and color of the natural world, but you're doing it and expressing your own vision. And I think that's what's fundamental and sets an artist like yourself apart from those who are more pedestrian. Yeah. yeah, I never want to paint like someone else. Like, obviously, there's so many painters. I just enjoy looking at their work and 
But what I'm really looking at is like, how did they solve that problem? Or how can I take that technique and put it into my work? But I'm not trying to, you know, I don't want to paint like someone else. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> You're, you're painting in a very original way. And um, one of the American artists that I admire the most is uh, Thomas Aikens, uh, 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 a Philadelphia painter who bridged the end of the 19th into the 20th century. And he was an extremely popular teacher, but he would not let a student imitate him. You know, mm. you basically, you know, throw your canvas away and make you start over if he found a student in his class seemingly imitating him. So uh, to me, that's the fundamental aspect of a su successful teacher. Let help yes. the student become themselves, the artist, the person that they are. Anyway, so that's enough of uh, my <laughs> philosophizing uh, for today. Uh, if there are no other questions, it is, dinner time or cocktail time so if there are <laughs> if there aren't any other questions um seeing no none i'll just say again amanda it was very enjoyable talking to you and seeing your work and i hope i'll see you at paint annapolis um and marissa thanks again for your input and your uh, technical support and thanks to everyone in the audience for um listening in and okay all right. Uh, good night. All right. Good night, everyone.